Hello and welcome to Growing Tech Fast, the condensed Org 3D podcast where we talk about growing tech startups with those who have grown them. Today I'm joined by Gorkem Savinch. He is the founder of uh, Qualitics, a highly innovative startup in the cybersecurity space. Gorkem, it's great to have you uh, on the podcast today. How's your week going so far? Well, it's going great, Ben. Thanks for asking and thanks for having me or having me on today. No, no worries at all. I've been really looking forward to uh, to this one. So without further ado, why don't we sort of start off by, um, do you just want to give us a brief intro, I suppose, in terms yeah. of um, who you are, yeah, what your mission is right now and the stuff you're doing um, at the moment? Of course, uh, name is Gorkin Savinch. As you said, I'm a computer scientist by training, software engineer by training. I, I studied uh, surgical robotics when I was in uh, grad school. Turns out I don't have the patience to wait for the FDA to approve every single one of my innovations <laughs> to come to the market for 10 years, you know? So, um, but I learned that I was really passionate about healthcare at that point. So um, the first gig I did out of out of school was actually a startup company. It was a joint venture between Johns Hopkins and Harris Corporation called Peak Healthcare Innovations. We were building medical imaging in the cloud, uh, sort of um, lo- long-term storage of medical images sort of technology, did that for a couple of years. Afterwards, um, afterwards, I ended up, one thing led to another, I ended up joining Johns Hopkins University and Medicine, that's my alma mater for my grad school, and mm-hmm. uh, and ended up becoming second in command to the CTO, built up the Technology Innovation Center for Johns Hopkins Medicine, built a team of about 80 people, and uh, with the premise of building innovative digital medicine tools, and uh, digital medicine uh, sort of software, uh, with the uh, with the ultimate goal of licensing those technologies out, building, build, getting them to be startups or um, or innovative solutions for other companies. Did that for a number of years and always had an entrepreneurial itch that I was just not scratching enough with <laughs> a napkin. So I was doing, I was getting into trouble on the side, right? I would, I, I would co-fund the company or I would join the board of advisors of another one. I would invest in another one. I, I was doing small time stuff and um, had a couple of mini exits from those, but it's just, you know, it's just that itch that I wasn't scratching enough. So um one of the companies that we had uh, that was licensed out of Johns Hopkins, um, I ended up joining that. That's Emoka Health, and um, helped scale that company up with uh, the founder CEO there, Sebastian. So I was the co-founder CTO, um, and it was on the medication adherence uh, space, making sure that people are taking their medication when they're supposed to. Uh, digitizing something called digit, uh, direct absorbed therapy. Great company, scaling, uh, very, very happy shareholder here. Um, at that point, after after Imoka, I had spent almost a decade in healthcare and I was getting a little tired of uh, tired of healthcare and I wanted to try my thing, my hand at a different thing. And, and I had co-founded a company, of course, getting into trouble on the side as well, as usual. I had co-founded a company in the financial planning and wealth management space called Facet Wealth. And Facet Wealth's premise is all about making financial planning and wealth management available to the mass out of the market. Anybody under a million in assets, they typically do not have access to money managers. And uh, we're, we we wanted to make that available, these certified financial planners available by a combination of technology and a subscription-based model rather than a percentage of AUM model and um, make it available to the 33 million um, um, 33 million households in the United States. Um, Facet Wealth was a great success, uh, is a great success, you know, post-Series C, Raised over 158 million dollars uh, from Warburg Pincus, Slow Ventures, Durable Partners, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so great success there. Um, I was the co-founder CTO, built up the engineering team, brought in a professional CTO, moved on to more of the data side, right? And on the data side, they, you know, two things were very important for Facet: one, building very innovative tech solutions, and two, building, um, building, uh, actually measuring everything that we're doing. So doing, you know, we were series A level at that point and we were doing series D level analytics, all sorts of predictive, prescriptive, descriptive analytics so that we can actually run this business efficiently. And that's where the idea for Qualitics came about. Mm-hmm. Actually, I have faced data quality issues myself as the as do every single technology leader and data leader in our world. We live in a very data heavy world and I saw an opportunity for uh, data, doing data quality at scale 
for not only for Facet, which I was building at the time anyway, but for other companies outside. So as the pandemic was starting, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go after this. I'm going to go after this idea. And that's that's how Qualytics was born. And I can go into that in a little bit um, further. Yeah, no. So that's, that's my uh, quick spiel. Yeah, it's a great quick spiel. It's kind of a, a whistle stop tour, I suppose, which is uh, exactly what I was after there. So I appreciate <laughs> that uh, answer. There's a, a couple of things really to, to go into there, I guess, in, in that early stage and and kind of those other startup experiences that you've had um one of the questions i was keen to ask you actually is something that i haven't asked before um i've spoken to multiple you know serial startup people where they they do a startup they grow it and then they go to found something else and something i've always wanted to ask is facet wealth for example right so i know from previous conversations with you you built that from around five co-founders to uh you know 350 plus people as you said as you've raised over 158 million now in funding why not kind of just stay there forever you know at what point do you think right this is a massive success but i'm gonna mm-hmm. i'm gonna exit here and i'm gonna go and start something else so that's a that's a great question, actually. <laughs> um, I am a strong believer that there are there are different kinds of people. There are kinds of people that are more the early stage startup junkies that are going after new ideas. It's all about product market fit, getting your um, you know get, getting the first MVP out the door. Working, I mean, of course, we're working ridiculous hours, but the startup <laughs> early stage startup junkies even more so, and. Um, and then there's the secondary part, which is the scale people, right? People that have experience with scaling startups and uh, getting getting companies from 10 million in revenue to 100 million in revenue. It's a very different skill set, especially not only, I think a little bit less on the technology side, and I think more so on the, uh, on the operational side, you deal mm. with that scalability issues. And, and it's different personalities. Typically, if you look at any any company that is public, the founding, it's very rare that the founding team is the one that is still running the company. Now, that being said, um, you know, that's that's one school of thought. For me, you know, I I I wasn't thinking about leaving Fasten at that time, right? It's it's uh I got so passionate about this idea that I and I saw the opportunity in the market. I talked to every single portfolio company from our investors that I could get a hand on. I talked to every single people, person in my network, basically saying like, hey, how are you solving this problem? Mm-hmm. How are you dealing with data quality? And, and sort of shared my idea on what I'm building, what I'm thinking about from a prototype perspective that I was building for internal use. And overwhelming response was, hey, if you built this, like I would want to buy it or I would want to invest in it. And just couldn't get away from the idea, right? Just, just could not get away with it, get, get away from it. Now, for startups, it depends. Like there are many examples of, of founders, CT, CEOs that actually scale the company. That's absolutely my plan for Qualytics, right? I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I want to retire doing this job. Uh, this is not a job. It's play. It mm. doesn't even <laughs> feel like a job. Um, and... Um, and yeah, so it's it it really depends on the situation. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. It's interesting, actually, how that wasn't your your um, your intention. You know, a lot of people that I speak to as well are just starting a company. You know, they're at seed stage still, and they're saying, right, the exit strategies in seven years will sell it and move on and do something else. So they've got their exit date almost before they've even reached a point where they're able to do that so it's interesting that yeah that was not kind of your thinking every every time i hear those i always crack up because (laughs) uh, you know you're an early stage startup you're like five guys building something and you're talking about an exit strategy seven years from now and we're gonna have a hundred million in revenue and blah 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 so much bs i'm sorry (laughs) it really is we're all doing this right we're all just (laughs) guessing and of course, you want to paint a picture for investors. You want to paint a picture for mm. potential prospects and customers that, you know, we have grand vision and we're building towards that vision. And of course, a lot of the times, a number of times that works. But if you, you're you going to pivot, 
you're going to pivot like crazy. You're mm -hmm. going to, your plans are going to change. Your understanding of the market is going to change. Your product market fit may not fit and you're going to pivot, right? Und understanding all of those as you build the company is, is important. So anyways, I digress. I, I just want <laughs> to jump in there. No, you're right. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta have a, a goal, but it, sometimes it is a bit like, well, you know, all you have to do is raise 250 million between now and then, and we'll be good. It's like, oh, okay, sure. cool. Does that sound and easy? in the <laughs> fundraising world of 2020 and 2021, that was actually realistic. <laughs> Nowadays, not so much. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that you've raised there, actually. I mean, it does seem like from, from what I'm hearing, that environment has done a bit of a 180 in the last sort of six months or so and, and turned on its head. You know, everyone um, and their dog seems to be getting funding uh, in that sort of 20 to, to 21 period. Um, and now it's proving to be seemingly a much greater challenge. Are, are you able to kind of speak to that at the moment, the, the current environment around that and what maybe you think has changed there? Yeah, I can I can talk to that a little bit on what I'm seeing. So. Uh, 2020 and 2021 were an anomaly. There were a lot of companies that were fun that were ridiculously funded on just an idea and no mar no product market, but no revenue. Um, we know of companies that are you know sub million in revenue that have raised hundred million dollars on a valuation of 500, 600 million dollars. That doesn't that's not traditional VC. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because there were many reasons for why that has happened. We don't need to go into those details, but uh, that fluke has happened. Some companies got funded that way and hey, good on them. Um, good on them, but I think a lot of those companies and a lot of VCs will agree with me are going to be in trouble in the next year to two years because now the belts are tightening. Now you need to actually back your revenue to your valuation. And if you raise that kind of money and now you're are you going for a 10x multiplier 20x multiplier because 100x multiplier 200x multiplier that doesn't work come on like it's look at all the all the public tech companies and their valuation multipliers right um mm -hmm. so that so to be able to get to that point they need to back their revenue up and they're going they're going to be they're going to be in trouble and then a number of companies now, and what's what's going back down is, um, you know, Series B, C, Ds are on pause, on halt for probably the next year and a half to two years. That's what mm -hmm. we're hearing. Series A a little bit, they will still remain. Seeds are less impacted, but eventually it will go uh, go down to that um, that uh, seed level uh, investments being on pause as well. And this is a little bit of a reset for everybody, both the mm. both in uh, both the um, startup founders and investors. Investors throwing money at any idea, throwing ridiculous amounts, and you know, big Bahamas come in and say like, "Hey, we're gonna put hundred million dollars into a company." I've seen companies that are uh, that are small startups that have no revenue go from C to Series B within the same year. Show me historically when that has happened. You don't, mm. how do you become a unicorn in one year and then you don't have revenue, right? So anyways, I think times are changing. It's a, it's a hard time. It's a hard time for everybody. But if you look at what has happened in 2008, a lot of great companies come about uh, in when there is a downturn in the market because our buyers are going to tighten their belts too. So if mm. you're able to actually thrive and sell within... An economic downturn, then you're building a great company. You sort of weed out all the all the all the BS. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a good way of putting it. I was trying to search for a slightly more delicate summary, but that that is that is exactly what it is. Yeah, <laughs> I don't do delicate. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd love to to spend a couple of minutes talking about qualitics more specifically. Then um, here, so. I know yeah. fairly recently in the last month or two, um, you've successfully added Bill Murphy to your board. Now, he's someone who has um, a really strong background in startups, a lot in the cybersecurity space. I know he sits on the board of um, Inky, VMware, Carbon Black, Phantom Cyber, those kind of companies. So what does someone like that bring to your organization? What impact does that have on a, on a daily basis? 
Yeah, great question. So Bill, Bill is fantastic. He's, uh, he was a founding CTO of Capital IQ. He was the CTO at Blackstone. It represents that bio perspective really well. He was actually one of the first checks into the company when I had this idea and I was uh, pitching it. Uh, after I started the company, I started fundraising a little. First of all, as a CEO, you're always fundraising, right? <laughs> so when I met Bill through a connection and uh, I was always fundraising, he wanted to participate in the seed round, uh, in the pre-seed round. And his reason for that is, look, I've built the data quality solutions throughout my career. Um, I was dealing with this issue 20 years ago at Capital IQ. So, and if I had your solution, I would have saved much, significant amounts of money uh, or this vision, right? Um, so one thing led to another, he first invested, then he, I asked him to join our board of advisors. So he started giving some advice there and then ultimately uh, pushed for him joining our, um, join our, um, our board, our board of directors. So, um, so that's great. Brings a lot of expertise to the table from the buyer perspective. And we're going after enterprises, you know, that uh, it's, uh, it's a, it's not an easy sale, but you know you have to you have to have patience. You have to have, you have to understand the the infrastructures that they live in, the problem space, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm. So he brings a lot of that expertise. The um, and of course he has served on so many boards, so he knows what he's looking for, and also um, can help me really understand the market. Right? What are the buyers looking for, et cetera? Now let, let me let me talk a tiny bit about what we do. Right, mm. uh, just so that we kind of paint the picture. Um, we uh, we started the company because you know because of getting frustrated with taking a reactive approach to data quality. Right. Mm. Uh, when I say taking a reactive approach, what I mean is typically what happens in any company is um, you are going to have your subject matter experts, your let's say your business analysts, your, your FBN analysts. They're consuming KPIs. They are using those KPIs to make decisions all day long, right? They're looking at CAC, they're looking at LTV, they're looking at your media spend, you're doing many, many KPIs that you can imagine. And uh, typically what happens is they will sometimes smell something wrong and they will say, wait a minute, this doesn't, this CAC number is too high or too low, something is off. They will go talk to the data team or they will go yell at the CIO or the CTO or the CDO and say, why is our data, data bad? Right. What, what's happening with our data? And we as technologists, we go and try to fix those issues. We uh, go look at our data warehouse on our various levels of our data warehouse, our data pipelines, our source systems, and identify where the issues are. And there are many reasons for data quality issues, right? You have anywhere from volumetric issues to timeliness issues to conformity of data to you know am i getting the right data at the right time in the right place in the right shape and uh, you know is, is it is it the correct thing right is it precise is it accurate and um it, sometimes you have duplicates sometimes you're missing data there are many many reasons for why we have data quality issues it's a it's a plumbing issue at the end of the mm -hmm. day and when we take a reactive approach, it's it's not productive because you wait for that subject matter expert to yell at you before you you go um, and try to write a test, or you try to be proactive, but then you end up writing thousands of tests manually, and then you're crossing your fingers hoping for the best that you are still accurate. So we saw the opportunity to do two two things, right? We we wanted to enable subject matter experts and data engineers to collaborate on data quality. And do and and automate as much as possible, right? To advance automation. So for us, what that meant is, we want to be auto, we want to be able to automate the discovery of the data quality measures that companies, because we know that sixty to seventy percent of of data quality rules are can be automated if we just understand the historic data. But you need to be able to upkeep do automate the upkeep of those data rules as well, while still giving uh, ability to manually input rules. And that's an area actually that we have uh, we have engaged our advisors quite a bit. We have engaged our customers quite a bit, our early customers and our, and our current customers as well, where understanding from the market, understanding from the ground, uh, what people are seeing on the ground is very important. Second thing for us is identifying an anomaly is just simply not enough, right? We need to be able to follow that anomaly to resolution whether that means remediation workflows, whether that means enrichment, whether that means segregating good data from bad data, 
all our capabilities that we do through our collaborative UI and API. Now, you had asked about Bill. This is an area that Bill has actually significantly impacted because Bill has firsthand experience how identifying that anomaly is not enough. You, you're just mm -hmm. telling me, hey, this data is bad. Okay, fine, but how do I go fix it now? I need to yeah. be able to fix it as I'm as I'm going along. So just coming full picture, right? That's what the that's what Qualytics is about. That's what we do, and how Bill has impacted that roadmap as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really helpful, and and it, it leads on to a question I had as well. Actually, is what what you were kind of talking about there is. Um, you know, uh, the subject matter expert is kind of realizing problems and then and then it's very react reactionary. What do you think is um what do you think is the biggest sort of or most common data problem that modern enterprises are having at the moment that they're kind of unaware of and you actually have to educate your prospects and your customers about the problems with their data before you then give them yeah. the solution? Yeah, it's a it's also a, another good question. So Look, there is this great migration that is happening now. Everybody's moving to the modern data stack as much as possible, right? Uh, not the huge companies that have, you know, petabytes and petabytes of data. Typically, they are not. But uh, most companies are moving to Snowflake, Databricks, Google BigQuery, doing data warehouse in the cloud. Now you have companies like DBT that are awesome that enable you to automate a lot of the, uh, do, do CICD around your uh, management of your data warehouse. And we have more and more data that we generate from our systems. Everybody and their brother are doing ELT instead of ETL, right? In the past, mm -hmm. we, had, we used to extract, transform that data and then load it. The right thing to do now is extract, load, and then transform because you don't know what you don't know out of your data. You may need it at a later time. You, you keep a sort of a longitudinal copy of your data going forward. Um, now that you're doing ELT, you are pumping data like crazy into your data warehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, you are you have so many different integrations between your systems. You're doing all sorts of manipulations on those KPIs. And this is why we started the company because you don't know the quality of that data. You just don't know. Unless you're deliberately writing stuff, understanding the metadata, understanding the profiling, the statistical analysis and writing data quality rules around every single field, you just don't know the quality. And sometimes, you know, sometimes from prospects we see like, well, you know, our price is price has always been between a thousand and three thousand. Salesforce always puts it right. So it's always going to be correct. Well, it is until it isn't, right? <laughs> and you, when you have that one inex unexplainable data that is somewhere something will go wrong and you will have a minus 10,000 in your price. And now all of your KPIs that are automatically using that field, they're going to be wrong. They're going to be skewed. And if you look at just the KPI, you're not going to know it because it's obfuscated. So having a systematic approach makes sense. And what we're seeing is, you know, the data world to me is the cyberspace of 10, 15 years ago, right? There are a lot of innovations coming about for the data space, but just as cyber did. And at first it was a lot of convincing for, cy for cyber buyers, right? There was no CISO role at that point. It was mm. going under the CIO or the CTO. And they were starting to ask, uh, you know, they were starting to say like, well, I don't have that problem. Do I really need this solution? until they got bit and then now they are <laughs> buying the solutions. We're seeing that in the data space as well. Um, so it's really exciting times. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic time to be working on a data, data startup, data and analytics startup. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much, uh, so much change and growth in, in that space. Um, and yeah, I know what you mean about the reactionary kind of people not actually knowing the data, the quality of their data before then trying to make, um, you know, high level business decisions and actionable decisions based on data sets, but they don't actually know how good that data is, you know, um, I guess like s serving up a 10 course meal to a food critic and having them judge how good your restaurant is, but you haven't actually checked that the food's even in date, for example, or, you know, um, I guess that's kind of the the equivalent and it seems so crazy to do it in that order. Um, so it's, <laughs> yeah, I can see why you're having so much response from the market on that kind of product, but it almost sounds like it 
needed someone to actually make it before people would realize how badly they needed it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Or, or they, they are, there, there are different camps, right? There are some customers that are like, oh, you know, we started doing something and oh shit, that doesn't scale. <laughs> <We've written laughs> 5,000 tests. How do I scale this where we can? How do I automate this? That, that comes up. Sometimes it's, um, you know, if I don't know about it, then it's not a problem that I have until you know a few months later they're like oh wait we do have that problem turns out that sort of thing as well so uh, you know it's uh it's it's an interesting market out there yeah no absolutely no and um look we've we've covered so much today um and we're coming to the end here so i've got one final question i was interested in in asking you before we wrap up here so yeah, we've talked loads about um, you know your, your previous startup experiences, and we've talked about the product that you're building and and the future really of that in in the market and the way that it's moving. I'm interested to, to just end on culture actually. Um, from a, a, a co-founder's perspective, how do you approach building a company culture, and is that something that's remained? pretty much the same and intact across all of your startup experiences or is that a process that you readdress every time you, you start something new um it's a process you start every time from new it is notoriously difficult <laughs> to maintain culture is it's something that is always top of mind right we gotta you, you, you gotta think about why do people want to join your early stage startup why do they want to be your first 10 employees of course, there's upside from equity perspective. That's one thing. But the secondary part is it's it's not a nine to five. You are not being told you can only build this part of this little thing in this little uh, you know part of it. They can have significant impact. They, they have, I really go by, uh, my Bible is Dan Pink's uh, book called Drive uh, okay. that really talks about what, what, um, what motivates knowledge workers? And it gets down to three things. Uh, he get, he boils it down to three things. It's mastery, autonomy, and purpose. So I swear by those, right? I want to hire people. I always try to hire people that are either masters or have the potential to be masters at their, at their craft. Um, autonomy to a reasonable extent, making sure that they have the, they have the capability to express their creative freedoms and the purpose right they have they got to believe in the purpose so i always try to instill master autonomy and purpose in the culture of the company that i build and you know we got to have fun while we're building this company because this is it's not an easy thing right oh yeah every day is a battle <laughs> yeah absolutely it's all about having fun especially when you're working the kind of hours that uh that you have to work with with those kind of missions you've got to in enjoy doing that and uh be excited about getting up for work exactly. every day i suppose um well exactly. gorkum it's been a fantastic conversation i somehow i sometimes wish that um i was like joe rogan and my podcast for three hours long because i think we could probably probably fill that quite easily but uh we're gonna we're gonna end um today uh so thank you so much for that it's been a pleasure having you on today yeah awesome thank you so much for having me then no problem at all <laughs> well uh, uh, for those you. of you at home uh thank you so much for tuning in and uh tune in next time for growing tech fast <laughs>